we use this opportunity to review what's going on in the Commonwealth with regard to initiatives and programs and activities relating to the internet and uh, the information economy globally. Um, just to put on record what the Commonwealth is, first of all, um, it's a free voluntary association of 53 countries spanning Africa, Asia, the Americas, Europe and uh, the Pacific. Um, the UK is a member of the Commonwealth and uh, we've been supporting this initiative, the Commonwealth Internet Governance Forum, since it started what, three or four years ago, um, really as um, a means for uh, providing kind of central place for information about initiatives that are happening um, as a resource. There is a Commonwealth IGF website, www.commonwealthigf.org, um, and that's a repository for a lot of information and for the kind of uh, practical initiatives that the Commonwealth IGF has launched, such as the Child Protection Toolkit, which we're going to hear about um, shortly, uh, the update of that. So you can, on the website there's, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of linkages out to um, um, other activities uh, where there's a direct uh, Commonwealth initiative and uh, it's, a, it's a valuable resource. The Secretariat for the Commonwealth IGF is provided by an NGO in Malta, Comnet, and um, uh, there's a colleague there who's helping uh, me with this uh, session today. Um, I think he may be trying to join us at, uh, at this session. I don't know if he's actually uh, managed to do that. But um, we've got a, um, a very impressive panel of contributors, people directly involved in, in um, the initiatives that we're going to review. And uh, I think I'll just now start to progress through our, our uh, agenda with regard to updates on those initiatives. I won't invite questions um, after each um, speaker has, has provided um, that update. We'll, we'll save questions to the last part of the uh, session. We've got an hour and a half um, and uh, there's quite a lot of information to get through and that's the purpose of an open forum like this really is to provide a lot of um, reporting and updating but uh, I am keen to allow time at the end for, for questions and uh, for some free discussion about uh, the general direction um, of um, initiatives and and, uh, and how we can maybe take the Commonwealth IGF um, um, initiative itself forward and, and, and use it more in, in, in the future. So we can bounce some ideas across, across the room about that um, when we get to it, the, the last part, as I say. So um, let's, let's move quickly on then to, um, to the reports. And um, to start off, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Tracy Hackshaw. Uh, to talk about the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative. Uh, Tracy is um, Deputy National Chief Information Officer at the Ministry of Science and Technology at the Trin in Trinidad and Tobago, and he's a board member of the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative, and so is directly involved in the steering of this initiative and uh, the rollout of the projects on the ground, and, and uh, the story is a very impressive one. Anyway, over to you, Tracy, to... Um, to, uh, to report back on, on how the initiative is progressing. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Good morning to everyone. So the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative, or CCI as we um, abbreviate it, it's a program of the Commonwealth Secretariat and is designed to provide member states with coherent and sustainable assistance in building capacity to combat cybercrime. Um, it's a uh, project that looks to arrange cooperation with a range of international partners who are committed um, to extend support to member states. We have over 20 partners right now to assist these states in developing all elements of an effective response to cybercrime, including prevention measures and establishing the appropriate legal frameworks and attendant legislative, investigative, 
technical and enforcement and prosecutorial capabilities. Among those um, partners, we have uh, the ITU, the UNODC, um, the Com um, Council of Europe, CTO, OAS, ICANN, Interpol, the Anti-Fishing Working Group, and many, many others. The Management Committee is chaired by the National Crime Agency of the UK, and we also have representation from several countries of the Commonwealth, including Trinidad and Tobago, the UK, Singapore, New Zealand, and Sri Lanka. Now, there are several live projects underway, um, so I'll just give a brief as to what's happening in those countries that we have projects underway. Um, Ghana. In Ghana, the CCI addressed the request from the Ministry of Communications of Ghana, and a scoping mission was deployed in February 2012. Subsequently, a detailed thematic report was sent back to the government outlining specific recommendations for a phase two program of work. A further request letter was received from the Minister of Communications, taking on board the recommendations from the Minister of Communications and outlined in a CCI report requesting additional strands of assistance. In April 2012, an in-country project coordinator had been identified and the collaboration between the Open University of the UK and two Ghanaian institutions has been set up to build capacity within Ghana. The collaboration will also see two pieces of research, specifically on e-waste in Ghana and the impact of cybercrime in Ghana. CCI facilitated a partnership between, the, uh, between Ghana and the ITU to set up a national CSIRT, which is currently underway. A CGA expert is due to arrive in Ghana with an, with, to assist with a review of the CGS. A formal launch with key stakeholders is scheduled to take place in early 2014. Um, Uganda. There was a scoping mission recently in July 2013, actually, and the subsequent submission of a detailed thematic report. The Ministry of Information and Communications and Technology in Uganda submitted a further request for assistance, taking on board the recommendations as outlined in that report. The request will be placed before the CCI consortium at our next meeting on the 6th of November 2013, where our member partner organizations will indicate how and where they can contribute to a phase two program of work in Uganda with an expected start date of early 2014. Um, in Kenya, the UN ODC um, led a scoping mission supported by the National Crime Agency of the UK in June 2013. A joint report of the mission was submitted to the government of Kenya and the response on the detail report is expected very shortly. Um, we expect by the end of this month and end of October. The response will also be placed before the consortium meeting at, um, on November 6th to indicate what resource is available to contribute to this project. It is extremely likely that a phase two program of work will also commence in early 2014 in Kenya. And given the close collaboration, collaborative partnership that East Africa countries maintain between each other, we expect and we hope that Kenya will collaborate with the CCI to identify and extend initiatives that can be rolled out on a regional level. And we're looking at um, rolling it out through Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and maybe several other countries in East Africa. In Trinidad and Tobago, um, in response to a request, a request received from the Ministry of Science and Technology, the CCI deployed a mission to Trinidad and Tobago in July 2013. A detailed report outlining 10 recommendations for a phase two program of work was submitted to the ministry, and a response to this is expected in time for the 6th of November meeting. And like with the Kenya project, given Trans-Bagos leadership role in the Caribbean, it is expected and it is hoped that together the CCI and the ministry can collaborate to identify initiatives that can be implemented at a regional level. And we suspect that we'll be very busy for the next year or so since we have received several project um, requests and formal expressions of interest from countries as diverse as Tonga, Namibia, Botswana, Dominica, 
and Jamaica. And once those requests have been processed formally, um, using formal letters of, ex of, ex of requests from the formal channels, we expect to deploy a series of scoping missions um, between now and 2014 to assess the current state of play in each of these countries. And we hope that within 2014, we'll be able to report successful missions and further programs of work in each of those countries, as well as the others that we expect phase two work to have started. And with that, uh, Mark, I think that's a report. Thank you, Tracy, for that very comprehensive account of how well established this initiative now is in terms of projects on, on the go. And indeed, there'll be a report about uh, the project, uh, the initiative rather, uh, at uh, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in uh, Colombo um, next, next month. Yeah. Um, the, um, the initiative was endorsed by heads of, heads of government at the previous um, meeting um, two years ago, and so we're, we're submitting a report on, on uh, how the initiative is actually rolling out. And also I might add that um, the CCI was um, referenced in the next steps document that the UK submitted at the Seoul Cyberspace Conference um, last week. Um, as Because um, there was a whole section about um, actions relating to cybercrime and capacity building and the CCI was mentioned there as um, one of the key um, initiatives to determine needs and, and identify um, um, opportunities for building capacity. So we've got the initiative profile raised at the highest level uh, in Seoul and, and, um, and, and again in, uh, in Colombo at uh, Chogham. So it's, it's excellent progress. Um, as I say, questions we, uh, for that uh, we, we can take at the end. So let's, let's move quickly on to the Child Protection Toolkit. This was the, uh, the first CIGF initiative, a practical concrete initiative. Um, and uh, it's now, the toolkit has been updated, so I've got um, two, um, the two lead contributors to that initiative with, uh, with us here. Um, uh, Sandra Marchenko, she's director uh, of the Coons Family Institute on International Law and Policy and the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, ICMEC. And uh, at, at, uh, to my far left, uh, John Carr, um, well-known expert advisor on online child protection. Uh, he's a board member of the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online, INAXO. And uh, uh, I think I turn first to, to John, really, to, to provide the update. Yes, thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark, and uh, it's great to be here um, in this Commonwealth gathering. The I can't remember the exact sequence of events of, of how this particular bit uh, got going. I think it started when the Commonwealth IGF were developing or, or talking about developing more activity around the CERTs and they wanted to make sure that within the framework of CERTs um, that the question of how to deal with child abuse images and the whole child protection agenda was considered to be one of the uh, a, a significant part or a substantial part of the um, of what a cert addressed um, and so they came to me and to the to ICMEC jointly to ask if we could help um, write a toolkit and a kind of set of recommendations for policy and legal changes that would help countries in the Commonwealth um, get to grips with this particular question. And I think part of the sequence of events also was that ICMEC uh, had just published the sixth edition or the fifth edition um, of their periodical review or periodic review of the state of play around the world uh, with laws in different countries. And what was very striking and what I picked up as a Brit, obviously more aware perhaps of the Commonwealth than our cousins across the Atlantic would be, I was, what was very obvious when you looked at the list of countries that that didn't have what you would call a very satisfactory framework of legislation, how many of them were in the Commonwealth? 
and that was another spur for developing this particular toolkit. So, so what, what, the, what the toolkit does, and Sandra's going to speak more about the specifics of the, the legal framework in a minute, what, what the toolkit does is it looks at the state of play around the world, actually, um, and, and specifically brings out the state of play in each of the, each of the Commonwealth countries. Um, but it also does more than that because, because it's meant to be an aid to governments. Uh, it also provides a substantial um, kind of background into the whole question of uh, what child abuse images are, what child pornography is, what the consequences of sexual abuse for children are, um, why, um, why you know, the, the fact that kids are abused is bad enough, the fact that in addition that abuse is recorded on a camera or in a video and then it's broadcast around the world adds substantially to the consequences of that abuse for the individual child. Um, what the, the toolkit also discusses, and this again is extremely relevant and important for the Commonwealth, is a sort of a prediction, I guess, about the consequences of failing to act. If you look at what happened with uh, m money laundering, uh, for example, uh, as, as several countries around the world started to take action against uh, essentially criminal gangs who were involved in money laundering, what quickly began to happen was that the criminals started to move their activities offshore from Britain, offshore from Europe, offshore from America, and they drifted towards jurisdictions where either there was little or no uh, legal framework to deal with money laundering or the local law enforcement community or the local government agencies didn't have the infrastructure to address it. Well, exactly the same thing was, is starting to be observed with um, child abuse images. Um, as more and more countries in the developed world and in the Western world uh, are, are dealing with child abuse images on the internet more efficiently and more effectively, we're beginning to see a drift uh, of images into jurisdictions where perhaps things are not quite as they should be. And what, what we were very keen to do was to alert Commonwealth governments and Commonwealth countries to, to this fact in the hope that they could take early steps to avoid uh, that happening in their own jurisdiction. So um, from a policy point of view, I think there's quite a lot of really good analysis in the latest. We had, we had to update it recently because uh, I think although fa Facebook certainly did exist and various other social networking platforms did exist at the time we wrote the first edition, things have moved on quite a bit in the intervening um, two or three years. And, and so we thought it would be useful to update the, um, the, the, the toolkit. And it, I can't remember exactly when it was published, but not that long ago. Six months ago, was it? It went up? Um, March. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the new toolkit is up there. There's a new edition of the uh, of ICMEX, um analysis, and uh, I'm going to hand over to my colleague now to uh, to, to discuss that. Thank you very much, John. So, as John mentioned, my name is Sandra Marchenko, and I work for the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We're an international NGO, but we're based in the United States. We've been working for about 15 years now to protect children from sexual abuse and exploitation and abduction, but with a particular focus on the use and misuse of ICTs and crimes against children. So for the purposes of the toolkit, um, as John mentioned, we have been working for a number of years now on a report which we call the Child Pornography Model Legislation and Global Review. Um, in 2010, it was the sixth edition that was included as a portion of the toolkit, but we've recently updated it, so we have now the seventh edition available, which you see here, and if you'd like to see a copy, I'm happy to share that. Um, the basic idea behind the model legislation was, as we've begun to see um, that the images of children, the sexually exploitive images of children on the internet have become you know, more and more younger children, more and more heinous images, we begin to recognize that as many countries are not dealing with the issue of child sexual abuse images online. Oh, and we know that there are more than two billion internet users worldwide, so the distribution of these images is virtually unlimited. So in 2006, we wanted to take a look to see where the legislation in each country stood and where the issue of child pornography was on the political agenda of each country and how they were addressing this particular issue. 
I'll preface that with saying we do use the term child pornography instead of child abuse images or child abuse materials for the purposes of the publication because it is um, a more recognizable term for one, but also because it is typically the term that's used in legislation. However, we are referring to the same thing. So when we began the review, uh, we, we were reviewing the legislation of the countries on five core criteria. Those, those criteria were first to see if national legislation even exists in a specific regard to child pornography. If that legislation has a definition for child pornography, and that is as something separate from adult pornography. If it criminalizes computer facilitated offenses, if it criminalizes the simple and knowing possession of child pornography regardless of the intent to distribute, and if it requires internet service providers to report um, what they suspect to be child pornography on their networks to a law, law enforcement or other mandated agency. And so the report itself, the way that it's structured, it has what we consider a menu of concepts instead of article by article, article language, which is different than many model laws, uh, in order to make it the most um, widely usable and adaptable for each country. It also contains a country by country analysis. So we look at each of the 196 countries based on those five criteria. When we released the first report in 2006, in 2006 we found that at the time we reviewed 184 countries, only 95 uh, or 95 of those countries, sorry, had no laws that were specific to child pornography. And in many other countries, the laws were simply insufficient. At that, at that time, only five countries met all five of our criteria. So as you can see, that's uh, not, very, uh, not very positive. Since then, we've used this model law to advocate for the creation or improvement of legislation on child pornography, and we provide the model law as a resource for policymakers around the world. We update the report about every two years, and we take a fresh look at the legislation in every country, and we ask each country's embassy to verify the data that we've collected. The most recent report is the seventh edition, and it was just published in March of 2013, so the data that was collected went up through the end of 2012. And our new results show that out of 196 countries, 69 countries now have laws that are considered to be sufficient. That means they meet the first four criteria of the criteria that we present. But 53 countries still have no laws in place. So as John was mentioning, that gives plenty of opportunity for criminals then to forum shop and look for countries where there are weaker laws. Among the Commonwealth countries, our research showed 17 countries have no legislation still. 15 countries meet between one and three of the criteria, and only 22 have legislation that's considered to be sufficient to combat child pornography. So of that 22, 18 meet four of the criteria, but only four meet all five of the criteria. And if you're curious, those four are Australia, Canada, India, and South Africa. So the positive side of this data, of course, is that we are seeing a growing awareness of the serious, seriousness of the problem and of a recognition of the fact that no country is immune from this particular issue and slow but movement forward on addressing the problem. As we've looked at the span of research that we've done since 2006, we've found that 100 countries have either improved their legislation or created and passed new legislation to address this issue. So 100 countries is pretty significant progress. Um, in the future, we hope to turn to looking more at implementation to see how this, um, this legislation that's been created is actually being used. Um, and just for reference, this model law is available on our website um, in Arabic, English, Russian, and Spanish at this time. Um, and I think that's probably enough on the model law itself. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sandra, and thank you, thank you John, uh, for setting the... Um the, the policy uh, context and so on. Um, I, I get the impression that the, the numbers of Commonwealth member states that are improving their uh, um, uh, legal environment and um, um, capacity is, is it, the picture is better. Yeah, yeah it's, it it's, it's yeah. going up, and um, and that figure you quoted of 17 with no no legislation is that reduction on like two, three years yeah. ago. I believe we were at. Um, yeah. I believe we were at 22 or so. Yeah. Last, the last time we did the review in 2010. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks very much. 
Um, okay, let's let's move on to um, the next report, um, which is. Uh, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization's uh, report on its activities. Unfortunately, um, the presenter for this, La Santa de Always, de Always from um, the Commonwealth, um, from, the, from the CTO in London, isn't able to join us online. He, that was the, uh, the plan, but uh, he had a, a last minute uh, clash and isn't able to do that. So uh, I'm going to. Um, uh, read out uh, the uh, the narrative that uh, he was going to use and uh, hope, hopefully I'll be able to capture most of the points because the CTO has been pretty active um, in the whole um, cyber security and cyber governance area as, as um, um, maybe some of you know. Um, it's, it's, this is one of the priority areas of the work of the, of the CTO and uh, uh, it really launched its uh, program of work in this area back in 2007 um, when uh, they took part in the ITU's uh, global cybersecurity agenda at that time and um, as at this time it's in it's it's engaged in in three uh, specific activities First of all, uh, the CTO joined with the ITU in implementing the Child Online uh, Protection, the, the, the COP, the COP, uh, in six Commonwealth countries, uh, Cameroon, Gambia, sorry, I shouldn't say Gambia anymore because they've, they've now left, um, but uh, Cameroon, uh, Ghana, Mauritius, Nigeria, and uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, it was launched in, uh, back in October last year, and the project is now um, being uh, rolled out. So there's the COP, uh, the CTO's involvement in the COP. And then secondly, um, they, uh, the CTO held the Commonwealth Cybersecurity Forum this year in Yaoundé in Cameroon back in April, hosted by the government of uh, Cameroon. Um, that was attended by over 200 delegates, including more than 50 organizations uh, and the agenda covered various aspects of cybersecurity including critical information infrastructure protection internet governance cybercrime uh, multilateral legislative frameworks certs internet resources cyber cyber safety privacy and uh, crucially um, international cooperation there was a joint workshop in the margins of the event uh, organized by the CTO and uh, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and UNCTAD on electronic commerce and cyber laws and there were parliamentarians there from over 10 countries. So there was the um, uh, the, the Yaoundé uh, Cyber Security Forum, so that was the second um, major activity the CTO wanted to report here. Thirdly, um, the CTO has embarked on a, on a project to develop a Commonwealth model on cyber governance based on Commonwealth values. This project was endorsed by uh, ministers in Abuja, representing CTO member countries and the CTO's governing council. This was last month, 9th, 10th of October. Um, and uh, following approval, uh, by ministers, the CTO will carry out a series of consultations, regional and bilateral, to develop the specific elements of this uh, model of cyber governance. So it's an important project for the CTO. They um, they will submit the uh, outcomes of that to uh, the Commonwealth ICT Ministers Forum, which is being held in London next March, 3rd and 4th of March, uh, at um, the Commonwealth Secretary at the Marlborough House. So, um, in accordance with developing this model, they will conduct a number of consultations relating to fostering innovation, freedom and, and uh, freedom of expression and understanding, promoting contributions to economic development, facilitating social interactions, recognizing uh, legitimate economic, cultural and security concerns, promoting multi-stakeholder partnerships, facilitating pan-commonwealth consultations and international linkages. These, all these elements of this model are set out in 
documents called the Abuja Declaration of the proposed Commonwealth Cyber Governance Model. Um, and this was really um, in recognition that a lot of work needs to be done to bring the strengths of the Commonwealth to bear on, on the governing of, of cyberspace. So um, uh, the UK and others will be contributing to this, um, to this project. Um, so that uh, is uh, the CTO account of their activities. Um, and just, just to say that, um, in, again, in Seoul, there was a reference to the CTOs um, um, embracing this area of um, broader cyber governance and um, the value of um, members of the Commonwealth recognizing the need to modernize their policies for the digital age. You know, there's this, this general sort of um, um, promotion through the Seoul process of, of um, uh, ensuring that uh, countries really get up to speed with regard to technology changes and uh, the opportunities for developing the global n uh, knowledge economy. So the, the kind of framework the CTO is working on was recognized in Seoul as providing a template that other regions and other international fora could well recognize. So it got a very, very good push, very good um, positive endorsement um, in, in Seoul. Okay, that's, that's um, a quick review of, of the CTO's um, areas of activity. Um, next we have ICANN, uh, and I'll just give a very brief account of um, what's happening within the Governmental Advisory Committee in particular within, within ICANN. I sit on the GAC, the Governmental Advisory Committee for the UK, and I've been convening um, the Commonwealth members of the GAC in sessions uh, at every ICANN meeting. ICANN meets three times a year and um, uh, the GAC meets in tandem with, with ICANN and, and the GAC has, a, has the opportunities there not only to develop its, its policy and advice to the ICANN board um, but also to engage with other stakeholders and so on. So it's an opportunity for the Commonwealth members of the GAC to exchange views and, and uh, see, uh, see if we can develop uh, a common approach on some of the issues, particularly with regard to um, um, uh, ICANN's globalization agenda and, and outreach to developing countries and stakeholders in developing countries. So we have a kind of very, very open agenda for, for the um, the meeting of the uh, the Commonwealth GAC members, which which I convene, and I also uh, pr uh, use that uh, to report on Commonwealth initiatives, such as such as, as the CCI. Tracy is there with me. Tracy being the uh, Trinidadian uh, GAC member, and uh, we've had contributions from Martin as well um, on the Commonwealth DNS forum, and and I can generally has a very um, recognises the importance of the Commonwealth as as. Uh, um, as, as an important association of, of countries and uh, uh, as, as part of its global strategy. We, could, we get a lot of very positive signals from ICANN in respect of what the Commonwealth can contribute. In terms of membership of the GAC, um, it has been increasing from, from the Commonwealth. Um, we, we've had um, New members join in the last year from the Cayman Islands, uh, Tuvalu, Namibia, Swaziland, and Zambia. So the membership is going up. We've still got, um, absent from the GAC, 15 Commonwealth member states, um, including uh, uh, a few African states, um, Lesotho, isn't a member yet, Mozambique, um, a number of uh, island states, Solomon Islands, Maldives, um, and uh, who else, Kiribati, and, and several of the um, Caribbean states. But the, the good, there is good news with regard to outreach to those Caribbean states that are not members of the GAC, um, because the Caribbean Telecommunication Union has been invited uh, to be an observer on the GAC, 
um, at the next at the next meeting, Tracy, in in Buenos Aires ne um, next month, we will have the the CTU there, and that provides uh, a channel, a linkage, if you like, to those um, Caribbean island states, Commonwealth members who are not actually uh, members of, of the GAC. And I'm thinking of the likes of Antigua, Dominica, and St Kitts and Lucia, and St Vincent, and uh, also Bahamas. Uh, hmm? And Grenada, yeah, and um, uh, Barbados, yeah. Um, we all, we're also uh, missing Guyana and uh, Belize, which is, um, which I think is unfortunate. But we will, we will try to um, reach out through the Commonwealth um, grouping, um, as well as through CTU and and the CTO, in fact, as well. Uh, to get those countries to, to recognize the value of participation in the GAC and um, understand that the domain name system is, is, is fast evolving. There are a lot of public policy issues that we need to consider uh, with the expansion of uh, generic top-level domains um, in particular. So there are a lot of critical issues that uh, the GAC is, is embracing. Um, the last meeting was in was in Durban um, back in July, and Buenos Aires is coming up. But uh, and after Buenos Aires, we're back to a Commonwealth member state with with Singapore in March for the next uh, ICANN and GAC meeting, and then London. London uh, in June will be the 50th ICANN meeting, and um, uh, so it's a bit of a milestone, for, uh, more a major milestone for, for ICANN and. Um, we, the UK government, we're a nominate to dot UK registry with, with Martin. Uh, we are uh, discussing how uh, we might um, um, use the opportunity of the London meeting in June um, to engage possibly um, government ministers. So we may be reaching out to Commonwealth ministers to, to come and join us in a, in a special high level meeting at, uh, at London. It's still uh, an idea that's um, uh, in early stages of development, but that's that's one of our, uh, the possible um, uh, significant uh, developments for the Commonwealth. And, and the CTO are members, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization are members of the GAC, uh, sorry, observers on the GAC, and, and they will have a potential uh, role to play in, in, in the London meeting in particular. And there will be a Commonwealth um, DNS uh, forum, which is uh, planned for um, for the London meeting, so that's a neat segue to um, to turn to Martin Ball for Nominette to um, to explain the concept and the progress in in, uh, in the planning for the Commonwealth DNS Forum at the London meeting next June. So Martin, if I may turn to you, thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, the idea of using um, London uh, and the ICANN meeting in London as an opportunity uh, occurred to us um, as I started meeting people from around the Commonwealth, Nigeria, from Kenya, um, and from India, uh, and started realizing quite what a wealth of initiatives were going on in those different countries, addressing real problems, some of those being um, uh, problems that were being shared, were shared by other countries, other organizations, uh, including, including our own. Um, so the idea was to uh, try to look at some way of capturing um, the dynamism in the uh, in the sector uh, in the different Commonwealth countries, and um, we developed the idea of doing a Commonwealth DNS forum. Now I quickly will add that uh, that's perhaps not the best title um, because it's going to go a little bit wider than the, just the DNS uh, and look at some more generally applicable um, internet-related issues. 
uh, but we're, um, uh, we didn't want to end up with confusion between a Commonwealth Internet Forum and a Commonwealth Internet Governance Forum. Uh, and so uh, as we're doing it in the margins of or just before the ICANN meeting, we decided um, to keep with the DNS uh, inclusion. Um, we're working uh, with the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization um, and as I said, we're uh, trying to base it on some really practical um, and problem-focused initiatives uh, through the Commonwealth. Um, and as such, we want to get uh, governments, obviously, but we also want to get um, NGOs, the civil society uh, people who are making so much happen in uh, in some countries, uh, and the industry uh, initiatives as well. So, um, and say nothing of academics. We really want to get a good range of the different actors, the different partners that are involved. Um, I've had an immensely positive uh, response from everybody I've spoken to uh, about the uh, about the initiative, uh, and um, I'm hoping that we will have a good cooperation with ICANN, uh, which will then allow me to free a certain amount of my budget uh, to contribute to travel costs. We won't have an enormous budget for that, but it will give us the opportunity to try and get uh, people who otherwise would not be able to come and who have got something to contribute to the discussion uh, into the meetings. Um, I'm also working, uh, I had a very positive reaction from um, PIR who are um, bidding for the .ngo uh, top level domain and they will have a very specific interest in uh, helping to support civil society involvement so this is this is really exciting me quite a lot uh, that you know we have got a real opportunity here uh, to get uh, some very interesting people around the table uh, and I'm talking with ISOC uh, because they have done a lot of studies working with partners uh, in, uh, in particular in Africa, uh, where they've done studies on internet exchange points and uh, economic environments and things like that. Uh, and these are studies that have been done locally, so you've actually got uh, the real initiatives uh, sitting behind them. Uh, they're very happy to help share that information. So um, I'm um, planning to partner with them both in Africa and in, and in India um, or outside South Asia uh, where we're getting that um, uh, interest. And I've also started discussions with an organization in India called the Digital Empowerment Foundation, uh, which uh, has as its uh, strap line empowering people at the edge of information. <clears throat> so what they're doing is they're looking at initiatives that help develop um, the uh, implantation of the access to um, the digital economy from rural uh, locations and a lot of these initiatives are actually coming from the ground they're the people who uh, are directly involved again uh, something I find very exciting as a contribution um, the issues we're going to cover um, and this is still quite provisional uh, but uh, it seems to me to be in the right direction we want to leave a fair amount of space um, to uh, develop a good discussion. Uh, so it won't be an hour workshop followed by an hour workshop followed by an hour workshop followed by lunch. It'll be, um, you know, let's get a good space, let's try and get some of the issues out there and then try and find what some of the solutions are. And uh, the, uh, the topic areas are uh, very, very broad, uh, certainly at this stage, are associated with promoting investment in innovation and in particular enabling the economic and social 
developments uh, in the country. You don't get that unless you've got the infrastructure in place, uh, but to some extent you need the infrastructure. Uh, you need the applications to justify getting the infrastructure in place. Um, uh, in discussions with Mary from Nigeria, uh, she told us about the development of internet exchange points in Nigeria and using the infrastructure in existence in the universities, which could well then be uh, directly applicable. Uh, I was talking to Australians uh, yesterday who've got a, a, you know, sort of quite a, a big problem on the shape of their country and the geograph uh, geography of their country. Um, and uh, so, you know, here is something directly where you can learn from what other people are doing. Security, obviously, that is a key one for us to cover, a big priority for everybody uh, around the globe. And the last area is partnerships. Uh, and this really is, um, you know, sort of trying to find a more constructive and practical way of talking about multi stakeholder engagement. Uh, where you uh, and the phraseology we're working on is partnerships to develop public policy and deliver economic and social goals where if you work together you can achieve something um, and uh, what I want to do at the end of this is to come out with some uh, practical outputs so that people who attend go away saying ah oh, that might be a solution for me. Uh, and one of the things that um, uh, came up in my discussion with the Digital Empowerment Foundation was could we uh, get some of these case studies, just a sort of one page sheet for them all, put them together in a booklet. Sorry about that. Uh, put them together into a booklet, um, uh, index it nicely and clearly so people can find things that are relevant to them uh, and um, you know the Digital Empowerment, Empowerment Foundation they've been running an award scheme for 10 years they have 300 winners covering the countries in South Asia uh, so you know we've got masses of material on which, from which to draw um, what I haven't told you is when it's going to take place. Uh, it's going to be the 19th and 20th of June, so immediately before, uh, the week before the ICANN meeting. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, people who will come to the ICANN meeting will come to um, this session. Uh, but I'm also hoping that people will come to this session and then go on into the ICANN meeting. Uh, and this is a link with the DNS when the new GTLD round went on. There were very few applications from Africa, for example. It would be great to start thinking about how can you develop that local community, that local industry that allow a future round uh, to come up with uh, new GTLD applications that were relevant to Africa or to India or to Southeast Asia uh, and uh, get that uh, additional, um, uh, additional growth um, and support uh, the infrastructure. Um, I think I'd better stop there because I am conscious that I was allocated five minutes and I've now taken ten, so uh, uh, please excuse me for uh, being long, but, uh, well... I'm very excited by this, and in particular by the way that people from all over the Commonwealth have responded to uh, this as an initiative. And if anybody wants more information, I can bore you for hours. Thanks. That was a very exciting 10 minutes, so much appreciated. Um, so people are contacting you directly, or is there some sort of established means of consultation and puts online for this, uh, Martin? Sorry, just a quick question on that. Um, I'm more than happy for people to come and grab me and say they want to be involved. Um, I was able to use Durban to reach out to, uh, there, were, um, there was a really excellent session in Durban that was directly involved uh, um, in discussions with African entrepreneurs, you know, people who were 
doing something. Uh, and um, yeah, I was uh, actually really excited by that because what you had was youngsters, some slightly older there, everybody was younger than me, but then they all are nowadays. Uh, but they, they were doing things uh, and they were talking about what they were doing. Uh, and I spoke to some of those people who were involved in that and they've said, yes, you know, they'd be really happy to get involved in that wider discussion. Uh, and so uh, ISOC Africa, uh, again, very, very interested. Um, and I've spoken here to ISOC India. Uh, well, no, sorry, he's uh, ISOC South Asia, but he's, um, he's based in Singapore and India. Uh, so that gives us that outreach. But if other people want to get involved, uh, I will be more than happy. This is an open process, uh, and I want it to be something that people find useful. Uh, hence why we're looking to try and make sure that it is output related rather than lots of talk about theory. Thanks. Uh, we can certainly put um, progressively as, as, the, um, as, as the preparations develop and um, your inputs, uh, the inputs that you receive help you um, start to finalise the programme and the list of issues. We can put information about that on the Commonwealth ITF website and that will link up with the ISOC websites, the Nominet websites and the ICANN websites. I think uh, we ought to have a kind of concerted effort to, uh, through, through the websites to uh, promote awareness and, and encourage further inputs. So, uh, it is indeed a very, very exciting, uh, exciting project. Um, Okay, let's go on to the second part of our uh, agenda because I think we've covered most of the um, initiatives and, and programs and um, um, uh, all, uh, the activities of organizations relating to the Commonwealth and, and the Internet um, in, in that first part. So let's go on to the second part, which is where we wanted to... Um, uh, uh, provide an opportunity for internet governance fora uh, which are active in the in the Commonwealth states or, or involving um, at a regional level uh, significant, number, significant numbers of, of Commonwealth states and um, we, we're going to have uh, three presentations um, uh, about um, um, five very important uh, and um, well-established uh, fora, and, and it'd be very interesting to to uh, to hear um, their current uh, status and the kind of initiatives that they're involved in, and, and compare notes and and see if there's um, some commonalities, which I, I expect there will be. And so, first off, we've got um, Mary Uduma, um, who uh, is managing director of Jaina. Is it Jaina? Jaino, Jaino uh, Digital Solutions. Uh, she was formerly with the Nigerian Communications Commission uh, and um, is currently chair of the Nigerian IGF, which you're going to talk about, but also uh, the West African IGF. You're um, representing the WA IGF um, on that. So, Mary, go for if you. Um, Bring us up to date on on uh, on those both your national one and the regional one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'm happy to be here, and um, I just want to bring us uh, to speed, uh, up to speed with uh, what is happening in West Africa, IGF, as well as as Nigeria National IGF. I think um, I want to add to what Mark said about uh, the, the ICANN IGF. I think the last meeting in, um, in uh, Durban, um, it was not only the GAG, I, uh, GAG members, the IGF, I mean the Commonwealth GAG members that attended the meeting he called, uh, the other constituencies like the CCs and the, and the, and, and, um, the ELAC. I think we're all there and uh, we appreciated that meeting and uh, we said it, it would be nice for us to have ICANN IGF, not just the GAG, uh, I mean ICANN, um, Commonwealth ICANN, not just the GAG, uh, Commonwealth GAG, 
or God common wealth. So it will be all embracing. So that's the point I want to raise and add to what Mark did, uh, said about um, at the meeting of the Commonwealth um, uh, countries uh, during um, ICANN meetings. Okay, in terms of, um, I start with Nigerian National IGF. Um, we held what we we'll call real national uh, multi-stakeholder uh, IGF started last year with the support of the government. It was government actually that backed us up on it, but it included the, the private sector and it included the civil society, included the academia, included the youth, even the military. Even the military. They were there, they were part of it. And so um, it was really uh, a multi-stakeholder um, uh, event. Uh, this year, uh, we had about about 280 participants, face-to-face -face participants, apart from the online discussions. So this year, 2013, it was held on the, on the 18th of uh, June, uh, 2013. And um, what we did was to to, to ask uh, the stakeholders to come up with what they think should be the theme and the sub-themes of the, of the IGF event. And um, we've just been holding it one a day, it's a day's event. So we'll try to make sure that we crowd as much as possible and uh, be able to do as much as possible. Um, and after we threw that um, invitation open, uh, we had a lot of uh, input from the from the communities. And uh, at the end of the day, a theme. We had so many suggestions for the themes and sub, sub theme, themes, but we finally um, zeroed um, on the on the theme: uh, internet governance for empowerment, national. Uh, integration, security through multi-stakeholders engagement. Why did we choose that? We found out that we had physical, not only the, the online security issues, we have the physical security issues because the Boko Haram were bombing the, 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 the uh, telecom uh, um, facilities, infrastructures. So we thought that we should engage our youth on that and be able to talk about that. We also thought, thought about empowering our youth. So in that case, the peculiar thing that happened, one unique thing that happened was that we held a workshop for the youth on uh, entrepreneurship opportunity in the internet. And um, it, was, it was well attended. We were planning for about 30 youth and we got over 60 of them. It was difficult for us to manage the space, and um, they, they learned a lot. Some of them, after the meeting, they've started an online discussion on how to protect or how, how not to be a bad, a bad <laughs> user of the Internet, but a positive user of the Internet. That's one thing that has come out of it. And um, they also asked us to do it again 2014, but we should do more than a day because one day was not enough for them. Well, we model our, our, our uh, IGF with the normal theme, the sub-theme of, uh, of uh, um, access and diversity, openness and privacy, just like the global IGF, but we, we, we do demonstrate it into what we actually, what will be of benefit to us. So we looked at the addressing the vulnerability of uh, critical ICT uh, infrastructure, which was really trashed and addressed. We looked at security. Um, my colleague here, Dr. Uh, Silvana Sehikoya, He's, he's director in uh, Nigerian Communications Commission, and, um, and uh, he actually mo moderated the security aspect of it because that is his business in the uh, Nigerian Communications Commission. Okay, so it, it, was, it was very inclusive. Uh, attendance was very good. We, were, we had even difficulties in managing the crowd because we had over 600 participants. We had, um, just as I said, it was open. 
the, and the minister the minister was the, the 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 minister came in person last year and this year to declare the the event open and um, the other uh, agencies of government like the Nigerian Communications Commission and the the development agency IT development agency in Nigeria their their chief executives or representatives came and we had the civil society and they were we even had the physically challenged group they were there so it was more of human rights the, one of the sessions was on human rights and uh, it was chaired by the human rights uh, chair commissioner in in nigeria and uh, for that reason it was very very productive um in terms of financing we got a major financing from the government. It was Nigerian Communications Commission and the NIDA uh, that gave us uh, the chunk of the money that we used. NIRA, which I am president of the .ng organization, also contributed. We had Google, we had uh, uh, Nigerian Society, um, uh, Computer Society, we had a, a private sector person gave us um, bandwidth for for online, uh, so we had people on online, and Isaac provided the Webex, uh, so there there was online for those that couldn't make it to Abuja. So there was e-participation. That that that's the the much. And um, at the end of the program, we produced the report, which was forwarded to the, especially to the minister and all the recommendations we had about 29 recommendations and some of them are things we think government should do and those that the private sector should do and those that the the civil society should do um i will also mention that our telecom operators also supported us they they were there they even brought their exhibition to for the for the for the one day so and um, uh, people are looking forward to the next uh, IGF. They're asking when is the next IGF going to be. Others are also looking forward to participating. And the good thing is that our, gov our government agencies are making good budget for the pro programs because, uh, because of my relationship from my previous world, so I had to go and make sure that they, they put it in their budget because if it's not in their budget, they cannot f uh, fund us. So we're expecting to have better funding next year, and we may have to do more than a day next year because people clamored for, they were say, saying that it's too short. So we had six parallel sessions, including the youths, and then we had the general sessions, and um, it, was, it was a good turnout. Um, and um, I think, we are seeing a positive thing coming out of the NIGF organization because some other um, initiatives that the federal government of Nigeria or government of Nigeria are doing, they are also looking at multi-stakeholder thing in uh, putting them to, to be. So the process is ongoing and is positive in our environment. I think that will be it for, for the Nigeria, the national IGF. Okay, I didn't, I didn't talk about the child online protection. We had a session on child online protection as one of the, the emerging issues and way forward. And um, you must have heard that uh, the, 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 the president's wife, our first lady, is a champion now, child online champion by ITU, and um, she's very, very keen in seeing that she does something in that line. She has organized the first youth um, uh, child online protection. They called it Youth Protection Online. So, and um, other things are coming up and uh, a center is being, the cyber security center of ITU is being established in Nigeria and is in the process. He is um, um, Really involved in it and um, in the in the in the establishment of uh, the cyber security center. All right, um, I think that is it for Nigeria. But for the West Africa, um, it was the sixth, yeah, sixth uh, West African uh, IGF, 
and um, the same process we used in Nigeria was the process. It happened on the 3rd of July, the West African IGF. And um, that of 2012, Commonwealth sent us uh, a program, um, I know, uh, a, pre a, a presentation, which I did on behalf of the Commonwealth IGF um, um, uh, at, the, at the program in uh, 2012. In Sarlone, it was in Sarlone that it happened, and it was good. And it talked about what uh, Tressa has already said about the cyber crime uh, um, toolkit to and the, and the template, and it was well accepted. Then in 2013, we didn't have much. Though I sent mail, but I didn't have response from the Commonwealth IGF. Um, um, office. So I hope that 2014 will have some collaboration. For West Africa, um, we have about 15 countries in West Africa. And uh, out of the 15 countries, 13 of them were at the, this is the highest we have had so far. It was held, held in Cote d'Ivoire. And um, it, they, we had sponsorship again from Google, you know, from um, Orange, in um, uh, dot africa and then phospha and the others that uh, helped us in getting that uh, but our challenge was that um, we couldn't have parallel sessions we had all um, all um, plenary plenary session for three days and um, the only challenge we had was that the accessibility was poor especially for our members that are challenged somehow. So we're still working on that. We hope that by the time we're going to do 2014, which we have sent out calls for, so a country that is hosting will be able to give us, um, uh, meet all our requirements. Financing is still a challenge for us. And we don't have government so much government backing. Although it was government of Cote d'Ivoire that carried uh, the, the bulk of the financing, uh, government of Cote d'Ivoire. So the civil society, like the ISOC also was, was uh, present. Um, we also had the press present. And um, again, attendance was poor. Why? Um, funding for participants from the countries. We ha will have only one or two people coming from the other countries. Majority of the people will come with, within the country that is hosting. So that's still a challenge. We're still asking members that they make provision. Why they are, make, where, where, why they are um, making plans for their national IGS, they should also make provision. And um, there have been a lot of national IGS from Benin, Niger, um, um, Senegal, um, Liberia, Ceylon, they are na national IGF, so they, 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 they are holding their own national, and the Côte d'Ivoire as well. Uh, most of us know Nenna. Nenna is part of it, and uh, she, she's been doing very well. So, and the coordinator of, ironically, the coordinator of uh, West African IGF is from East Africa, Judy. <laughs> She's from East Africa, and um, well, as at now, Cote d'Ivoire is the chair of the West African IGF until the next one. So the the next country that is going to chair um, host it will be the chair until the next IGF. And what did we talk about in West African IGF? We looked at what was pa paramount, what a challenge to us. We looked at peace because there was war in um, in. Um, in, um, in uh, Mali, uh, Cote d'Ivoire had just finished its own. There's this uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. There's uh, the, the other ones in, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso. So we said internet governance for peace. How can we? And one of the, one of the, one of the unique things that happened in West Africa was that we asked the youth to tell us what, how, we can use the internet to to bring about peace. And one of the one of the testimonies we heard was that during the Cote d'Ivoire War, it was the ICT that helped. They, they created a, a website for people that are disturbed to come 
uh, for help, for counseling, for for uh, oh Nana. <laughs> for counseling <laughs> and for help. And again, there was also the issue of uh, a, a, um, a, an MP in um, Cote d'Ivoire that uses her website for her campaign, and she is the best. In the, in the, in the, oh, good for, for you. <laughs> so, um, I, I think that's where I will, because of time, I will end there. I don't know whether Nina has anything to add. add. She has just come in from, from, I don't know where, with a new face. Someone is tweeting from this room. Yes. And it's that person that pulled me from wherever I am. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, May. Thanks very much. That's, 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 uh, very interesting to hear, and also very. Um, it's, a, it's a reminder of some of the some of the key issues that some states, in terms of unrest and civil unrest and impact on infrastructure and so on. It's um, um, certainly wish everybody well in in in, in the region, but uh, in your case, especially in Nigeria, with the challenge, the additional challenges that uh, that um, kind of problem presents. Um, okay, thanks very much. Let's move on to the uh, East African uh, IGF and, uh, and also the Uganda IGF. So I turn now to Lillian Nalwonga, and uh, Lillian is, um, is a policy officer with, uh, can I say CIPESA? Or is it, yeah, I can, CIPESA. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not familiar with the acronym. And also um, the business, business uh, development director with ELAB Limited and is... Uh, as I say, representing the East African IGF and also the Uganda IGF. So th thank you, Lillian. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> or, I don't know, because that seems like Mary uh, hide quite a lot. Um, just uh, uh, starting from the Uganda IGF, uh, I just uh, want to share just uh, success stories. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. Who is this person? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> there is surveillance going on, even in this room. You need to disguise yourself and you need to sharpen your eyes and look out clearly. Someone is watching you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Nice to have you here, Nina. <laughs> All right. Um, the Uganda IJF, I'll just share something unique we did this year. Um, we've always had... Um, challenges of getting private sector participation and um, we usually had a model where we start with online discussions where we get to get different um, uh, topics shared on different mailing lists and choosing um, the report from there. This year around uh, we, we covered all issues starting from access, cybercrime, the critical internet resources and um, emerging issues like uh, open, open data and uh, internet and um, online child protection. Now, what have we been able to achieve is that during last year's discussion, there was a lot of debate on online child protection. And uh, this was an emerging topic. It's still emerging, and different people don't know how to address it. They have different perspectives. Um, coming from Africa, where we still have issues of access and emerging cybercrime issues like fraud and all that, they feel child protection is just a by the way. But what we found last year was there was mixed, react um, mixed reaction, yes. And um, what we decided was to pull this out. We sought funding from ISOC because I also represent uh, the ISOC Uganda chapter. So we took advantage of the ISOC community grant and um, we were awarded a, a grant of 10,000 US dollars just uh, to do a piloting in um, three urban schools in Uganda, just find, finding out how these kids are using the internet. Um, if they do have school labs, of course, they do, but how do the teachers interact with them, what kind of material they share with them, and whether the parents are involved in their, in their engagement with the school and the kids and, and the teachers. Um, the research is not yet out, 
it's not yet out, but it's ongoing. Uh, but we felt that this would feed further into the awareness creation about the child online uh, safety and probably roll out in um, other parts of the country. We are working with the Ministry of ICT and uh, we intend to also um, advocate or lobby Ministry of Education to um, help us uh, or not help us, work with them to have a toolkit we intend to, to develop, to share with our different schools. Um, that is about uh, one of the key successes we got out of the Uganda Internet Governance Forum 2012. But this year, we decided that rather than having a general forum where we, we get these so many diverse issues, we'd rather have the online discussions, pick one, two topics that can be used to bring together the specific um, sectors for that uh, issue. So this year around uh, 2013 we identified access, connecting the last mile, and uh, cyber security but looking at internet freedom. And um, we got participation from the private sector because they were interested. We are talking about infrastructure issues. Um, we got participation from um, the implementing agency, um, National IT Implementing Agency, because they are working on uh, uh, having some cyber security, cyber, cyber security uh, forum and establishing the, the SAT, which participation was quite good. On the contrary, we decided not to have a full day event because usually full day events, people do not come in the name of, they do not have time, they are not dedicated. So we decided since they were, we were just looking at two topics to just have a half day, but we put in the e-participation, we put in remote participation. And interestingly, um, we had Nena following the event. Um, we had uh, people who were just seated in their offices going on their daily day-to-day uh, -day work, but at the same time they were feeding into the workshop. and quite interesting interaction was coming through the tweet feeds and uh, the remote participation, uh, the remote participants than the people who are inside the room. So I, we were just experimenting with that model, but uh, we decided that this is something we will take on. So um, looking next year, we'll just feed into some of the recommendations we adopted on these two issues and probably took, uh, pick a topic different from this year's main national forum. So um, I'll leave it just that to the, uh, the Af to the Uganda IGF. Although this year the challenge we get, and probably I'll, I'll put it to Tracy, uh, you mentioned something on cyber security initiatives, something you're working with the ministry, uh, is we do not get participation in terms of Okay, they do contribute to the drafting of the program, feeding into the content, but usually the challenge we get from them is their lack of participation in such events is lack of funding. So I put it to the Commonwealth um, IGF. If you have this initiative you're, you're doing, you mentioned uh, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, probably, I don't know how big your, your, your funding basket is, but it would be nice if you brought these people to feed into this capture I don't know, that would kind of motivate them to further support the initiatives, you know, um, at the local level. Uh, going to the East African IGF, um, I'm glad that uh, we have uh, representatives from East Africa. We have uh, Mwenda Kivuva from Kenya, and uh, I'm seated here with uh, the next host of uh, the East African IGF from Tanzania. Um, Abaka Kassan and Kenneth, uh, they are from Tanzania, they'll be hosting uh, next year's EIGF. Um, just sharing, uh, this year's EIGF was hosted in Burundi. Um, it was quite a challenge because the organization took, uh, was, the preparations happened I think in two months because at one point we, we had challenges of uh, coordinating the different, uh, with different stakeholders within the region because we had um, countries like Rwanda not having a national forum this year. And uh, probably for those who are familiar with the East African IGF, it has been a very successful model, but uh, for the last year, and this year we had challenges getting coordination, uh, coordinating the different stakeholders. Because one is um, 
um, the convener last year went down and we never really sat down to say, okay, how do we move forward once the convener, you know, steps, steps down? So there was that uh, um, lack of a structure, like how we would move on if someone else, you know, stepped down. And that kind of disrupted our organization and uh, coordination. And we had... Uh, we initially had thought that having it uh, hosted, having the East African IGF hosted under a regional body, like the East African uh, Communications uh, Commission, IACO, would be a good idea, of which they say they would host, but when we did try to make follow-up, they said they did not have funding, they did not have the capacity, and besides, um, back then I think it was Kenya that was chairing the regional body and then there was a change in government in Kenya so it all disrupted. We had new people coming in and we did not have ways of engaging them and I think up to now if Kivuva could share their Kenya IGF story or experience is they, ha they had challenges engaging with the government this year. Um, so that bit of challenge of engaging different uh, stakeholders um, without having a structure. But um, I think uh, this year we had a diverse sort of, the program was rich. Um, we managed, I, the host Burundi managed to get funding from ISOC, from the private sector within Burundi, from the ISPs, they were very supportive. And they funded uh, two, representatives, uh, two representatives from um, the different countries. Um, and then we have uh, countries that are so well organized like Tanzania IGF, they are able to mobilize their own funding to attend such meetings, which is um, a bit interesting. Uh, so we were able at least to have representation from all the countries. However, the discussion did not have this diverse perspective from all you know, the different stakeholders from the countries, but at least it was a success, it was a breakthrough. And uh, we agreed that um, would be, we, we are setting up a, a new steering committee, getting a new coordination under uh, the, the chairmanship of uh, Tanzania, and um, um, the process is starting, I think it already started, but uh, core um, sort of uh, feedback planning starts in early January, and um, I think the East African IGF will be held June, between June and July, we haven't set up the date, but it should be mid-July, uh, mid, mid-year. So we have some six months of planning, st setting up the structures and making them, um, making the whole process uh, useful and meaningful. But then we also would like to have participation from regional bodies. I think in the past, uh, the Commonwealth IGF participated in the forums held in, uh, in Nairobi. I think I remember either you participated in two of those. I, I did. Indeed. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, we would like to have this sort of diversity feeding, sharing how you're doing your, your stuff, how the West Africa IGF is doing, so that we are able to coordinate and learn from each other. Thank you. Yes, I think that's, thank you very much, uh, Lillian. And, and that last point, I think, is is, 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 a, is a very important one about uh, cross-fertilization and sharing experiences. Both the examples of the East African and the West African IGS showed that you've had different challenges but also some commonalities and uh, that's very interesting to note. And, and uh, Quickly, Martin, do you want to um, just uh, do a quick, very brief summary of, uh, of uh, the UK IGF and, and what's happening there? Thanks. Okay. Um, if I start off, though, by saying that both Lillian and Mary have come up with uh, initiatives, real practical initiatives in their country, uh, in their countries, uh, and uh, that sort of underlines uh, my sort of wish to get those out into the public for the um, uh, Commonwealth DNS Forum, uh, because uh, you know that's stuff that really ought to be shared because we can all learn from it. Um, and uh, to be uh, also quite honest, um, that I'm uh, I'm an ideas thief. Um, this year, uh, looking around and seeing what was happening in East Africa, what's happening in West Africa, in developing the networks uh, of national and regional IGFs, 
uh, we realised that in the UK we needed to start rethinking, rejuvenating the UK IGF. So this year has been a year of uh, regrouping, relaunching and trying to identify our priorities. Um, and I'm not ashamed of plagiarism at all in this case. Uh, I think it was actually really quite useful. Uh, what we've done is uh, try and improve uh, our stakeholders' engagement uh, and try and get, get a much broader uh, ownership of the process. Um, and uh, the other thing we've tried to do is uh, try to take a longer view. So in other words, look forwards rather than starting in, De uh, in December or January and thinking about um, the, um, in this case, October. IGF meeting to start thinking through those longer term ideas that we would like to see on the agenda for 2014. Um, and uh, the things that stayed stable uh, was that we've been engaging with parliamentarians um, uh, right away from the start of the UK IGF because we think it's very important to try and help parliamentarians understand the issues that they are dealing with, you know, engage with the legislator before he writes his laws. Um, it's better to have informed laws than uh, laws that uh, are just, uh, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, and also uh, the uh, youth IGF in the UK, which has been um, quite a, um, quite a, a, a solid, con continuous development process. Uh, and um, I'd also uh, like to sort of recognize that uh, right way through the IGF process, the uh, UK government has been actively involved and in particular uh, we have always had ministerial engagement in the events uh, and I'm looking to Mark to make sure that uh, that carries on into the future. I'll do my best. <coughs> the, um, the key issues for us this year uh, were child online protection, very much a politically uh, important issue this year uh, and uh, it was uh, online data protection and the rights of the child that was uh, the discussion there. Uh, good to hear that there are other, um, you know, sort of uh, Africa has also got that as being quite an important uh, issue. Uh, we looked at the future evolution of the IGF, what we as a, uh, a group of stakeholders th thought that uh, the IGF could be doing better. Uh, and uh, in that discussion, uh, the discussion next door, the surveillance topic uh, came up. Uh, but it, that wasn't one we had time to prepare. Uh, identity and trust, internet governance principles, security, uh, but in this case it was quite closely linked to Seoul and the um, uh, international cyber crime, uh, cyber security, international cyber conference process. It's a title that always gives me problems. Um, and IPv6 and spam. Um, as I said, we're, we're looking, we were looking at that stage to try and develop our thinking and um, our planning process uh, for the IGF 2014, <clears throat> and um, we've got quite a quite an aggressive, I'm not quite sure exactly how we're going to be able to resource this, uh, but quite an aggressive pro process uh, for uh, trying to get stakeholder engagement and ideas and the input uh, in, uh, in there uh, to feed into UK MAC members, to feed into uh, stakeholders who are involved in the IGF process. Uh, but for me, uh, one of the key things that came up when we did the wash up from the UK IGF discussion in September was that yes, we We've ended up with something that was very important to do a national thinking, but at the same time, we start to recognize that the national uh, and regional IGF process starts putting people into silos. You know, they think 
think locally, which is a good thing. And what we thought would be, uh, for us, particularly useful, would be to try and reach out to the other national and regional IGFs who share a particular priority with us and start trying to exchange some of those ideas, some of that thinking, so that together we get different views, different uh, ideas in, and that we can use that as a way of saying, well, why don't we work with East Africa on topic uh, X to put in uh, a proposal to the, uh, for a workshop in the IGF to work with West Africa on topic uh, why uh, for the same thing uh, and try and build those cross linkages so that we don't stay just in silos we're doing that uh, uh, groundwork uh, and building up uh, so I'm putting that on the table uh, I would love to hear uh, more from both of both of you and for any any other who are working on uh, national regional IGFs that you know how can we do um, you know uh, I've I had discussions with the Indian uh, process uh, and once again you know that's probably something we uh, can will be able to spot clear shared objectives thank you oh I think I think we've lost our chairman Okay, Martin, thanks very much. Uh, there's certainly, I think, a common um, desire here, I think, to develop those linkages. So that's very interesting. That's something we uh, certainly take forward from this. And I, within the IGF here, here, in, here in Bali, there's been sessions exploring that very, in very concrete terms. So that's it's very interesting that... Uh, with, so uh, yes, there yeah. have been, um, but... That discussion about doing the linkages, I felt was getting lost in that discussion. So that's why I thought I'd, I would raise it here, because I think it is actually something very important to do. Okay. Well, thanks very much for raising it. Unfortunately, we are out of time to, to develop any discussion on that, but I'm sure we can uh, continue uh, perhaps... Um, outside of this meeting to d discuss how perhaps the Commonwealth IGF can, can help facilitate that. Now, John's got a dash, I know, to get a flight. Is there anybody with a question, quick question for John? And any remote, anybody coming through remotely? I'm sorry? Yeah, anything on child online question. protection for John and uh, Sandra, do you know? or No, okay. So, John, you're, you're excused. I don't want to you. miss your flight. Um, but let's, let's perhaps take those two... Um, yes, two participants, no questions. Yeah, yes, no, no questions. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, well, we are out of time, but um, we, can, we can take, I think, maybe one or two questions because we're technically over, but uh, does anybody have any points on anything we've raised? It's been a lot of uh, material. The one lesson I've taken is, uh, is that... Uh, one and a half hours is really not enough for the wealth of activity that's going on in the Commonwealth. But anyway, yes, please. Thanks. Uh, and my name is Mwendo Akivova from Kenya, ISOC. Uh, I wanted to observe that we have had some capacity building initiatives in the region, uh, mostly those funded by ISOC. And also APC actually had an internet governance school in South Africa where some members uh, from Commonwealth attended, even some are in this room. So this capacity building are very important because they enrich the content that we offer in our local IGFs. Uh, we, we have, we, we had, previously we have had challenges in engaging different stakeholders to, to either attend or participate. Uh, in our ideas, I wonder what is the best method to probably approach them so that they can participate fully in our initiatives. Thank you. Okay, so it's a question about um, facilitating participation. Does anybody have any um, reaction or... Uh 
Oh, sorry. I just have a question for you, Mark. Um, um, and maybe Tracy. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, Cyber Security Initiative. Don't remember my first notes. Um, um, you aware that the cybercrime one? Or, yeah, the or, cybercrime yeah. initiative. Um, the Africa Union is working on cyber, some cyber security strategy. Um, how are you working with? Are you working with them in any way, um, or you having two parallel different initiatives? Because, like I heard, you, there were just a few scattered countries within Africa. Um, I don't know. Have you been able to look at what they're doing and what you're doing with with the individual countries you're dealing with in Africa, Commonwealth countries? Tracy, do you want to take on? So, so I'm sure Mark will um, deal with the the other issue. But um, the, just to reiterate that the Commonwealth side kind of is for Commonwealth Commonwealth countries. So the Commonwealth African countries are. Um, picked up in the initiative. Um, I'm not aware that the, AU's, the AU mark is directly involved, but we, our outreach will be through agencies like the CTO um, through Africa, the ITU, and so on. So when we reach, when we do outreach, it will come um, from leads that are generated through missions that may have um, come through conferences or seminars that these agencies would have had and will come back to the CCI as um, a request for help or assistance. Um, so I'm not aware that the AU is directly involved, but Mark, Mark you can speak to that issue. I don't know. I'd have to check. I, I don't know. Um, okay. I think this will probably have to be the last question. Yep. Uh, no, uh, it's not a question. I wanted to offer a solution to... Yes, okay, uh, great, yes, to come yeah. back to Kenya, I saw. Yeah, um, Kenneth from Tanzania. Um, yeah, engagement sometimes can be a problem. I'm using the word sometimes because it's not supposed to be a problem, actually. Uh, the best way of making sure that we are engaging as many people as possible to me is whenever we are thinking of engaging them is to talk to them in a way which enables them to see the benefit from their perspective, from their point of view. Because at the end of the day, people buy in into benefit, not what, what something else. So if we approach things from that angle, it will be easy to, to get people to be engaged in whatever we, we are doing. That's one. Two, it's always not taking no for any answer. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. That's that's, that's very good um, comment. Thanks very much. I think we'll have to wrap up there. I'm sorry the time for discussion was, was very limited, but I think it's a reflection on how much is going on and, and the wealth of um, really productive activity sometimes in the face of severe challenges too which is which is makes it even more impressive um, I think this forum does provide a very valuable opportunity to sort of share experiences like we heard uh, from from UK and East Africa and uh, West Africa that's been a very uh, valuable um, exchange I think and we could probably take that further in some way. We'll have to consider how to do that. Uh, I think there was a question earlier about funding in the CIGF. There isn't any actual fund at the moment. Um, we did have um, a bursary scheme to uh, facilitate uh, youth participation. That, that uh, isn't um, operating at this time, but that was another, uh, I think, very useful exercise that we undertook as CIGF. Maybe we want to revisit that as we start to plan ahead. I just invite everybody who's here to spread the word about uh, the opportunity to, to explore how we take this Commonwealth IGF um, concept forward and how we might develop it, how we might use the uh, website more to facilitate exchanges and, and uh, interaction and, and sharing of experiences and canvassing of views uh, on, on what perhaps one national forum is doing uh, the problems it has and how it can learn from the experience of others and likewise at the regional level and how we might develop some kind of um, 
um, Commonwealth um, um, common perception of how the whole IGF concept, the multi-stakeholder model, can advance um, as we uh, progress through the review of the, uh, the WISIS um, outcomes from 2005 at, at the UN and in the ITU and uh, through the other UN action facilitators, this 10-year this, uh, review, the process that's going on, there could be value in using the CIGF um, to, to share views on, on how the WISIS review can progress, the kind of common aims we might have for the vision beyond 2015. So I think there's a lot of potential and uh, it's a matter of perhaps identifying some resources but also capturing ideas and inputs uh, from, from people here and people who are listening and following this and uh, your networks of contacts in, in, in the regions and so on. It would be very useful if um, we could um, uh, promote the idea that this, this is a valuable f forum, the CIGF, and invite people to contribute their thoughts and ideas on how to take it forward. That, uh, I would welcome that in particular. Yep, Mary. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, just quickly, um, I have two suggestions. One is I don't know where, what, whether we have reports or train, train analysis of attendance of uh, Commonwealth countries at IGF meetings. One. Second one is since CTO has a lot of um, events and programs, is it possible? For each country that is hosting CTO program, should be able to have a slot to talk about the CIGF. Thank you. That's a very good idea. I'm meeting with um, Tim Unwin, the CEO uh, in London shortly. I'll put that to him. I think that's worth exploring with him, see how he reacts, and then uh, we put that on the website as, uh, as, as one idea and see how more widely stakeholders react to that, but I think that's a very good idea. Thanks very much, Mary. Okay. Right, okay. Um, I think we had better wrap up as we've gone over time. I want to thank all the guys doing the um, technical facilitation for the session. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank, you all, thank you all for contributing and uh, thank you for your support. And uh, I wish you well in your various projects, if you're involved in uh, projects and uh, Look forward to uh, talking to you again in the near future and doing further updates, and right. especially uh, looking to you, Sandra, on, on the toolkit. Thank you very much. And safe travels to everyone. Yes? Bye-bye.